So it's a pleasure to give this laudation on behalf of uh, John Pardon. Um, John's been sort of revolutionizing the subject I think about whilst I hang around in my dotage. Uh, he's a very young mathematician. He's also a very broad mathematician. So I'm not going to talk by any means about everything that he's worked on. But the Clay citation specifically mentions his work in symplectic topology. Um, so symplectic manifolds are studied through counts of pseudo holomorphic curves. So I will spend the following few slides saying something about what a symplectic manifold is and what a pseudo holomorphic curve is. But if you accept that slogan, then clearly sort of fundamental questions in the subject will include how do we define these counts of holomorphic curves? How do we compute the counts of holomorphic curves? And a little bit more philosophically, how do we think about them? Where in the mathematical firmament do they really live? Uh, so people at John's own talk earlier today will have heard a little bit about sort of more recent work in this third vein. But John's made really profound contributions since his work as a graduate student to how we think about all three of these questions. And they go under the sort of slightly intimidating to me names of implicit atlases, uh, co-sheafifying the wrapped Bukaya category and derived orbifold bordism. So I will try and say a little tiny bit about each of these at the end of this talk, but much of what I'll do is try and sort of set a stage for where his work comes in. Um, John's also done a body of spectacular work on one of um, Hilbert's problems on discrete group actions on three manifolds. He gave a lovely talk at the ICM on that, but I won't talk about that at all. OK, so, so we're in differential geometry, differential topology. A symplectic structure on a manifold is a closed, non-degenerate two-form. So a two-form means we have a family of skew-symmetric forms on all the tangent spaces, and these are just non-degenerate as bilinear forms, so they identify the tangent and cotangent spaces. So then linear algebra tells you that can only happen if the manifold is even dimensional. Sort of definitionally, any smooth manifolds built by gluing together open balls by diffeomorphisms. So you could get a, a geometric structure on a manifold by insisting that point-wise, the derivatives of those diffeomorphisms belong to some subgroup of the general linear group. So if you took sort of GLNC inside GL2NR, you'd get complex geometry. If you took the orthogonal group, you'd get flat manifolds. If you take the linear symplectic group, you get symplectic manifolds. Um, and maybe the key feature of the subject is that any smooth real valued function on a symplectic manifold defines a flow by symplectomorphisms. You can turn the one form DF into a vector field using this non-degeneracy of the bilinear form. Um, and a consequence of this kind of abundance of symmetries is that symplectic manifolds have no local invariance beyond the dimension. So the subject's sort of broadly topological in character. There's nothing like the Riemannian curvature you get if you have a family of symmetric bilinear forms on the tangent space. Locally, they just look like a ball in R2n with your favorite constant skew form. OK, so you could wonder, why do we study this subject at all? There is sort of a host of motivations. Let me very briefly mention three. Um, so you can classify the kind of infinite dimensional Lie groups that act locally, locally transitively on some Euclidean space. There's a very nice answer to that classification. There are no exceptional infinite dimensional Lie groups. And in the handful of things that come up, the group of symplectomorphisms of Euclidean space is one of them. Uh, any smooth algebraic variety is symplectic. Uh, and somehow symplectic geometry is bound up with the geometry of families of varieties. So if you have a moduli space of varieties, sort of nearby points will be the same symplectically, but not algebraically. So you get sort of monodromy representations naturally live in symplectic mapping class groups. And then a lot of motivation comes from classical Hamiltonian dynamics. So if you think of R2n as having 
position and momentum coordinates and you take an energy function, then Hamilton's equations uh, say sort of dh dp is q dot, dh dq is minus p dot. So here, p and q are both kind of vector valued. These are systems of equations. Um, so you can just derive from this the classical conservation of energy. And you can check that a diffeomorphism of R2n or some open subset u is symplectic exactly when it sends solutions of Hamilton's equations to solutions. So symplectic manifolds are the sort of broadest stage on which Hamilton's equations make sense. Okay, so as John mentioned in his talk, um, we're often fixing an almost complex structure on our manifold, so a way of multiplying by i on the tangent space. Um, and that lets you write down this Cauchy-Riemann equation. So we think about maps u from a Riemann surface sigma to x, and we ask that this be complex linear at the level of the derivative. Okay, so in a local coordinate st on sigma, um, this is a nonlinear PDE because the almost complex structure varies from point to point depending on where you are on the Riemann surface. And it's an elliptic PDE, so somehow if life was kind and everything was transverse, the solution space would have some, you know, well-defined dimension or at least virtual dimension. It would be a manifold where transversely cut out. Um, and this PDE shows up in sort of all parts of the subject, but looking at our motivations, for instance, um, classical enumerative facts in algebraic geometry, the fact that uh, there's a unique line in the plane through two points or a unique conic through five points. You can think of these as sort of giving examples of computations of enumerative invariants which count solutions to this equation. Um, in this case, sort of the situation is studying maps of sigma equals P1 into X equals CP2 um, with appropriate constraints. We can also study maps from not a compact Riemann surface, but a punctured Riemann surface, for instance, a cylinder. And that ties in to the motivation for the subject from dynamics. So if I take coordinates S and T on the cylinder, sort of R times R mod Z, and I look at a slightly deformed version of this Cauchy-Riemann equation, depending on a function H on X, my Hamiltonian or energy, which maybe depends on time, so I write down this equation du ds plus j du dt is grad h of u. Well, under very mild sort of finite energy and non-degeneracy hypotheses, as you go to the infinite ends of the cylinder, solutions to this equation converge to periodic orbits of the underlying classical Hamiltonian system. So my energy function h defines a vector field, x sub h, hence a flow on my manifold. And so I can just look for sort of loops in the manifold, which are periodic orbits of this flow. Um, and somehow symplectic topologies played a role in solving kind of dynamical questions about the existence of periodic orbits. So this is a, an elliptic PDE. So in contrast to some of what we heard about earlier, the challenge is not so much to kind of construct solutions, but to sort of understand them and the interplay you get between sort of counts of solutions and algebra. Um, so there's a sort of large package called Fleur theory, which in one guise concentrates on studying the case of maps from Riemann surfaces with boundary. Um, so then the boundaries of your surface, say a strip R times 0, 1, should map to uh, Lagrangian submanifolds of your symplectic manifold. These are something like the real points of an algebraic variety defined over R. So they're sort of half dimensional subspaces on which the symplectic form vanishes. And the simplest instance of this algebra is what's called the Fleur cochain complex. So you take a pair of these half dimensional subspaces. Typically, they'll intersect in a finite or discrete set. You take those to be the generators of a chain complex whose differential counts these holomorphic disks. So the Euler characteristic of this complex recovers a classical topological invariant, the homological intersection number of these two half dimensional submanifolds. So it's some sort of corrected version of classical homology theory. 
And in classical differential topology, you study submanifolds by kind of wiggling them around to meet minimally. So if in this cartoon you wanted to cancel two intersections of L and K, you would slide one of them across a disk with boundaries on the two submanifolds. And in Fleur theory, you're somehow only allowed to do this cancellation if there was actually a holomorphic disk there. So it's sort of refinement of classical surgery theory. Um, and once you're counting maps from a strip, which is like a disk with two boundary marked points, well, you might choose to count maps from a disk with three or four or five boundary marked points. Um, so it turns out that uh, there's a category whose objects are Lagrangian submanifolds satisfying suitable conditions. These Fleur groups, the homologies of these chain groups, form the morphisms in this category. Counts of triangles define the composition map, uh, inputting two intersection points and giving you coefficients of a third. And altogether, you end up with a rather sophisticated algebra structure called the Fukaya category, which is a triangulated A infinity category. And it has a wrapped cousin in which you allow certain non-compact Lagrangians when your ambient manifold is non-compact, for instance, an affine variety. And there's a, an important example, a motivating example, of uh, the cotangent bundle of a manifold, which is such a non-compact symplectic manifold, in which this wrapped category recovers a sort of classical but rather sophisticated topology invariant, which is modules over chains on the base loop space. OK, so this is a sort of background setting for symplectic topology and holomorphic curve theory. Okay, and Gromov and Fleur sort of explained that the presence of the symplectic structure means that these spaces of holomorphic curves, the solution spaces to d bar equals zero, have kind of geometrically meaningful compactifications in which the Riemann surfaces acquire nodes. But nonetheless, if you're not in this nice transverse situation, these spaces can be extraordinarily wild. I mean, algebraic geometers have these kind of Murphy's law type theorems where they say anything goes, but all of their spaces are basically pussycats. I mean, they're kind of, you know, Whitney stratifiable, fundamentally very friendly things. But, you know, any compact subset of Rn is the moduli space of solutions of J holomorphic curves in some setting. So what does it mean to count solutions in this kind of enumerative geometry? So as John said, there's a kind of local structure theorem that's at the heart of everything that in this generality was really pinned down in the work of Fukai and his collaborators, which says that locally these moduli spaces look like you take a, a, a manifold U with a finite dimensional bundle E over it. They're both acted on by a finite group gamma uh, and you have an equivariant section, and you take the zero set of that section mod gamma. But this is a local statement, and as you move around on your solution space, somehow these local presentations vary rather badly. In particular, the dimension of U and the rank of E vary, the finite group varies. Um, only this kind of virtual dimension is well defined. But we want to extract a kind of analog of the fundamental class of this moduli space, so that if the moduli space was zero dimensional, we could count its points. And the classical strategy was some sort of complicated induction, which would patch local transverse perturbations. Uh, but having local transverse perturbations, usually transversality involves smoothness. These spaces, you know, at least at first glance, only kind of stratum-wise smooth. So a huge amount of work went into making sense of this. Uh, John came along with a very beautiful new idea, which was not to try and patch geometric local perturbations, but instead to just patch together sort of algebraic local approximations to what globally you would want this virtual complex, virtual fundamental class to be at the level of cochains. Okay, so a, a fundamental class lives in homology, so it's some sort of map out of cohomology. Um, if your moduli space was just S inverse zero mod gamma, cochains on it would look like equivariant cochains. Those are a bit like chains on the ambient U relative to the complement of your wild moduli space. Um, that, if your bundle E has a Tom class, is something 
that you can really map to, say, Q um, by using Poincaré duality and your sort of section of your obstruction bundle. So John replaces this by a sheaf of cochain complexes that plays the role of this sheaf of local perturbations. And this has a lot of advantages. He sets things up such that he never makes a choice. He's understood that every time you make an unnecessary choice, an angel kills a kitten. Um, so uh, so the, the sort of construction is extremely insensitive to sort of, you know, choosing to set up your foundation slightly differently. It avoids all the kind of smoothness hypotheses on these local sort of thickenings U of your moduli space. That doesn't just simplify the analysis, but it makes it much easier to carry out the analysis in situations where, for instance, you want equivariance with respect to group actions. Um, because transversality is hard and equivariant transversality is harder. And in particular, this thread both to a kind of streamlined proof for the Arnold conjecture, which was first proved by Fukaya and Ono and Liu and Tian independently, but also a rigorous definition of contact homology, a sort of holomorphic curve theory in the setting of uh, a contact manifold times R, a very special kind of non-compact symplectic manifold, um, which is difficult because it's by its nature an S1 equivariant theory, amongst other reasons. OK, so this is in the vein of how do you define invariance. Next, let me say something about how you compute invariance. So we have these rather complicated categories, the Fukaya category or its wrapped cousin. Um, I said this Fleur homology is some sort of approximation in some sense to ordinary homology. And it's borrowed many structures from classical homology. So it has cup products, it has ring and module structures. There are sort of long exact sequences of Fleur cohomology groups around. But all of this structure still only gets you so far. So Kansevich uh, introduced this idea of mirror symmetry in which you compare the Fukaya category on one manifold to the derived category of sheaves on another. And sheaves we're very used to computing via local to global arguments. And partly inspired by that, he put forward some rather precise kind of Mayer via torus type suggestions for computing uh, at least wrapped Fukaya categories from local pieces. But you know, I said at the beginning, every symplectic manifold locally looks like a ball, but the wrapped category of the ball is just zero. So the sort of usual open sets we thought about in symplectic topology are sort of useless for this purpose. They're not kind of mirror to the sets of the Zariski topology. So in joint work with Shiel Ganatra and Vivek Shende, uh, John introduced a new class of non-compact symplectic manifolds now called uh, Feinstein or Louisville sectors. And they're somehow non-compact in two directions, horizontally as well as vertically. So you should think of something like the cotangent bundle of a manifold with boundary, in which you know, you'll deal with compactness issues for holomorphic curves at one infinity via maximum principles, but in a different horizontal infinity via sort of a fundamentally different mechanism coming down to the open mapping theorem. Uh, and they proved this kind of Cauchy for local to global property for the wrapped category uh, under appropriate kinds of covers. And the proof for that really involved building you know, a vast amount of technology. Ganatra, Pardon, and Shende wrote kind of a triple of you know, spectacular papers. The first two are kind of about 150 pages each. These wrapped categories have sort of avatars that are much more controlled. They're not cohomologically infinite. The wrapped categories are expressed as localizations of things that have much better algebraic properties. Um, and in the end, that entire kind of package is used to produce this kind of Cauchy property, which in turn leads to rather formal proofs of mirror symmetry in sort of a number of new cases by, by Vivek and co-authors. OK, and then just to end, more in the vein maybe of John's own talk, how should one think about these invariants? Okay, so it follows from John's work that actually these moduli spaces of holomorphic curves admit global charts. You don't need any kind of atlas in the end. They're just globally uh, sort of cut out as the zero set of a section modulo now a compact Lie group acting with finite stabilizers. 
So they're closed subsets of finite dimensional orbifolds, and they're well defined up to some notion of bordism. But you know, how should you think about that? Well, classical bordism groups sort of arise in homotopy theory from the pontryagin tom construction. If you have a map from a high dimensional sphere to a low dimensional sphere, you make it smooth over a point, then the fiber is some uh, finite dimensional manifold. It acquires a framing because its normal bundle looks like just the tangent space of the base. Um, and this sets up an equivalence between the stable homotopy groups of spheres, a classical object of homotopy theory, and framed bordism, which is a sort of superficially much more geometric theory of manifolds. Okay. And you know, there's an obvious map one way here, and the fact that you capture all of framed bordism relies on the fact that all manifolds embed in Euclidean space and that the space of embeddings becomes very highly connected as the dimension of that space goes to infinity. And John proved the kind of orbifold or derived orbifold analog of this. So one can write down sort of rather tautologically a kind of homotopy type uh, with the property that when you look at the space of representable maps from your sort of building block orbifolds, the classifying space of a finite group to this homotopy type, what you get is always contractible. But he proved a, a very long-standing conjecture that there are enough vector bundles on orbifolds to show that this homotopy type you could really think of as a limit of finite dimensional orbifolds, which are playing the role here of larger and the larger dimensional Euclidean spaces. And the upshot of that is that this kind of Kuranishi bordism, this derived orbifold bordism, is really governed by some generalized homology theory or spectrum. So there is some cousin of you know, the classical bordism like framed or spin or complex cobordism, this new Kuranishi bordism, holomorphic curve theory is naturally landing us there. That's where we ought to be working. And then it's you know, somehow a job for the homotopy theorists to help us compare that to other things. So in all of these three kind of advances, you know, one really sees an exceptional clarity of thought and the importance of having somehow the right definition and the right setting for a theory. And that's kind of bread and butter to an algebraic geometer post Grotendieck, but in differential geometry and analysis, we don't have such a nice category. And you know, I think over the evolution of the subject, the advantage to thinking this clearly about very basic definitions was maybe lost somewhere between Atiyah and Graham and the present day, and John's helping us put, put us back on track. So um, thank you, John, for your work in the subject, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>